Hey, it's Jamie York here, and I want to talk to you about buy-to-let mortgages, finance, and what you need to consider before taking on your next buy-to-let investment opportunity. Before we go any further, make sure to hit the subscribe button if you're interested in finding out more about property investment that you can immerse yourself in to accelerate your property investment career. So what is a buy-to-let mortgage and why is it important to watch this video all the way through? Well, a really big part of that is the fact that buy-to-lets make the main component and makeup of a portfolio of investment right now. And there's a lot happening in the market that you need to think about. So a buy-to-let mortgage is just one of several different financing options when you're buying. So, you know, you could purchase with cash, you could get a buy to let mortgage, you could get some form of option, you could get some commercial finance on there. The issue with all of it is it's going to depend on your experience level, what you're going to want to get on. And I'm not going to deep dive in the others. Um, some of it's self-explanatory, some that I can do in further videos. But commercial finance, the downside of it is often it's repayment and the loan to value isn't that great. And I'll get into what that is later. So let's cross that out. Option is a bit creative for this video. So we'll go through that and much further and cash. Obviously the benefit is you can move quickly. You've got all of the power, all of the cards are in your hand, but ultimately a really big benefit of investing in property is being able to safely leverage debt. And cash is a form of equity. And if you're utilizing that, you're very quickly going to run out of money. So let's focus on the buy to let market. So buy to lets really, it's gonna be a divide between your personal, name or your limited company, your LTD or an LLP, but your corporate structure. So there's pros and cons of both. So originally, if you go back about two years, we're in 2020 right now, but if we go back to 2018, most of the tax benefits out there from owning property were pretty much all in personal name. So you could um, stick some furniture in the property and then you could depreciate that against your value of putting in your property. You could do additions to your property or improvements to your property and offer right your rental um, income for years to come uh, and a multitude of other things as well. Uh, however, what ended up happening uh, coming in place was section 24, which has had a massive impact um, through tax and in your personal name, what the government decided to do is decide that the interest that you're earning, or sorry, your interest as a cost would no longer count as a legitimate cost. So if you end up becoming a high taxpayer, a lot of people, it's not tax beneficial to own it in your personal name. A lot of people, and obviously check with your own uh, financial advisor or your accountant to work this out, but a lot of people, you're getting most of the tax benefit from being in a limited company. Why is that important? It's because a couple of years ago, there weren't many lenders that were lending to limited companies because pretty much most of the market was in your personal name. So most people, I'm not saying everyone, this is not financial advice at all, uh, will end up buying in your personal name. The problem is it's quite difficult purchasing a limited company if you don't have any personal landlord experience as well. So this is not giving financial advice. This is just what most advisors would do. Typically, you would purchase the first one to four properties in your personal name. And what this allows you to do is build up that experience so you can become, in the eyes of a lender, an experienced landlord, an experienced investor um, as you progress. And then you will be, get more favorable terms in your limited company. Okay. And then typically you will build them up in your limited company if you're growing your portfolio so that one, it's protected as an investment and two, you're not worrying about, you're not worrying about the personal tax liabilities coming through. Okay, so 
how is it typically structured? Well, first of all, there's a couple of things that you're really going to want to look at with a buy-to-let mortgage. Number one I look at is the loan-to-value. So at the moment, during filming this, we're going through COVID-19, coronavirus, and loan-to-values have been thrown all over the place. But typically what you're looking at is 75% loan-to-value, okay? And what that means is on a £100,000 purchase, I'm likely to need to put in 25% or a £25,000 deposit. On that, let's say it's a 100K purchase, you're gonna put in 25,000 pound deposit and you're going to need to put in around 75% loan, okay? So that's gonna be debt, as in a mortgage. And then often what people are trying to do is leverage as much as possible. So you can sometimes get 80% loan to value where you only need to put in 20 grand. I personally don't like over leveraging myself from a risk perspective. I think property should be seen as a long-term game, not the game of accumulating as many properties as possible, okay? And there's a lot of people that over leveraged in the last recession, 2007, 2008, that ended up getting wiped out because of over leveraging, okay? So typically what we're gonna look to do is get around 75% loan to value. Obviously, if you can add value to the property, increase the overall value through refurbishment, and then refinance to 70, the new value, 75% loan to value that's going to be great you're going to safely be able to pull out a load of your money maybe leaving in five to ten grand because of the added equity that you've got in there the next thing that you want to consider is the lendability okay so the lendability is what people are going to look at what the lenders are going to look at to make sure you are lendable and what that's going to do is they're going to look at how much you are earning as an individual compared to the mortgage rates, okay? So typically it's gonna be how much it's costing you over, um, over the year, and then it's gonna be compared against what you're looking at, but also as a multiplier of the rent coming in. Now, most lenders will lend at about 125 or 130% of the mortgage rate, I like to do 150%. Let me just explain that a second, okay? So if I'm looking at, let's say 150, if you're 130%, you're gonna be safe from a lending point of view. I just like looking at it as 150% to make sure I'm extra conservative and protecting myself. Let's say the mortgage is going to cost 500 pounds per month. What I'm looking for is the rent has to be a minimum of 150% or times that by 1.5, it's meant to be a five, 1.5, and which is gonna be 750. If it's much less than 750, then there's not much movement in terms of management fees, void periods, maintenance, and not a lot has to go wrong to turn that asset, that paying asset, into a liability. Okay, so we're gonna be making sure that we've got that lendability criteria ticked off. You need to get your own financial advice, whether it's going to be in a company or a uh, your personal name. A lot of people go, well, if you put it in your company, you're protected by the limited structure. Often that's not the case because the bank's going to ask for a PG, which is a personal guarantee, which means that they can come after you personally if you screw up anyway, okay? So the protection level is probably not there as much as you would think by putting it in a company. The final thing you're gonna to wanna to know is what the interest rates are. Actually, it's not the final thing. The second penultimate thing you wanna know is the interest rates. So when I say interest rates, I don't actually mean the interest rate of what you're getting now because right now you might get a 1.72% interest rate and it's like, wow, that's really cheap. But you also wanna look at the lifetime interest rates. You know, Interest rates, this was before I was investing in property, were as high as 15%. Okay, now is it realistic to go that way consistently? No, but you probably wanna look at a long-term average. So I personally think anywhere between five and 6% as a protective method. And I'm not saying you look at it and go, is that a good return? But if it were five to 6%, would it still be looking after itself? Would it be washing its face? Would it be a good investment? Would it be adding money to your bank rather than taking away each month, okay? You're really gonna to wanna to look at that as a yearly interest. 
and then factoring in that in your calculations as much as possible. Okay, then maybe one of the final things that I would look at is the entry and exit. So it's the three E's, entry, exit, and early redemption. It's the thing that most people don't actually look at. So entry, are there any admin fees? Because sometimes you can have a 70 grand property where it's good interest rates, but then you've got 500 admin they're gonna charge you 700 for the RICs. And suddenly they don't charge you up front for that, they add it to the loan. And so actually your representative interest becomes quite high, okay? Then also the exit. So if you're getting bridging terms or anything like that, you need to look at if there's any exit cost to this. Most mortgages won't have it, but it's always worth ticking off and just double checking. The final thing is early redemption. Most people, if you're buying a property below market value, you're going to want to go in, refurbish the property, add value, and then refinance to pull your money out. Most, most lenders have a two year early redemption penalty. It's not to say don't go with the lender if you're intending on refinancing, it's just understand that it's a 1500 pound or a grand or two grand, so you can factor it into your calculations. This is something even experienced property investors miss out on, okay? And it's really worth knowing because if you're intending on refinancing and going again and you're expecting a certain amount, and you miss that actually it's gonna be two grand less, then that's really gonna impact you as much as possible. So I think number one is look at your tax structure, you know, get some financial advice on whether it's better to buy in your personal and or your limited company. I think a strategy that is quite common for most is to own, you know, between one and four in your personal name on current tax structures. And obviously they change all the time and it depends on your financial situation. So please get independent financial advice for this but structuring it in that way. Then you're gonna be looking at the loan to value, typically 75% uh, to 80%, but most of the time 75% loan to value. You wanna get your interest rates as best as possible. Always look at the long term, typically five to 6%. And then you wanna take account of the three E's when you're going in. So it's the entry cost, the exit cost, and any early redemption figures. And that is everything that I can think of that you're going to want to think about up front when you're looking at your buy to let mortgages. Hopefully that's been really helpful guys. What I'm gonna be doing in separate videos moving forward is I'm gonna be sharing my calculators, our calculators in the business, and I might even give you the opportunity to get a copy of that. So if you're interested in finding out more, make sure to hit the subscribe button to, for, to get more videos like this. Make sure to smash the like button as well and leave a comment and I'll make sure to reply to everyone. I'll see you in the next video.